Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Merci là. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here for this panel discussion on the autonomy of uh, Europe to health industries. Thank you to our guest, uh, Mr. Bernasconi, uh, Paul Hudson, Pierre Luzo, Olivier Nata. We've seen uh, Bernasconi, who is uh, on a remote uh, 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 connection with us, and we've seen Paul Hudson uh, last week. We have a number of uh, topics that we would like to address regarding the autonomy of Europe, the scope of uh, relocation of health industries, the time for that, the cost that it would entail, the role played by governments, and uh, whether it is the right priority for Europe to think about it. We're going to start with the first topic, which is the scope that could be envisaged for relocating health industries or part of them in Europe. And we're going to start with Paul Hudson's video, because we ask him this question first, and then we hear our guest. So we are going to watch uh, uh, Paul Hudson's video. Firstly, I've heard the calls about the reshoring for Europe. Uh, we know clearly that in many ways China is self-sufficient, the U.S. is self-sufficient, and we at Sanofi have over 40 manufacturing sites in Europe, but we don't make every single essential medicine. When you talk to health ministers across Europe, they've gone out of stock on really important medicines, could be HRT, could be cardiovascular disease, um, over the last years, not just including the pandemic. The pandemic has brought it to the attention of everybody. 63% of the world's active ingredient for pharmaceuticals is made in India and China, almost half of it in China. So when you're in, under pressure, you've got to say, how do we make sure the essential medicines in Europe are made in Europe for Europe? And that's the only way to do it. Alors, donc, Paul Hudson dit que, uh, so les, Paul Hudson tous les sont pas is saying that and a all medicines are not being manufactured in Europe and that we're strongly dependent on the US and China. He's talking about essential drugs, saying that they could be uh, uh, located in Europe as a priority. And Nicola, would you like to say something about what Paul Hudson just said, and would you like to wake us up? I'm sorry, but uh, I am uh, not uh, really in favor of that relocation in Europe. I uh, agree to talk about it with you today, but I don't believe it should be the priority. I think it's uh, a little bit deceptive because the fact that uh, uh, we don't have that many opportunities to relocate uh, those productions, like Paul Hudson said. Well, he's not here, I'm contradicting him, and he's not here, so that's not the right thing to do. But we could have those essential medicines without producing them. But it didn't work so far. No, it didn't work because we hadn't bought them and we hadn't stored them. But I have a mask and I'm not making any mask. I buy them, I store them, and I have enough of them so I won't run out of masks. And if I were to make them, uh, they, won't, they wouldn't be uh, of uh, good quality. So what I'm saying is that when you think that in order to be sovereign, you need to manufacture on your own ground. But there are some limitations to this. We can produce less quality products at higher cost than what is being produced uh, abroad. Economists talk, uh, are talking about uh, comparative advantages, exchanges, uh, in fact, are there. The, the, you know, when we were thinking that we should uh, manufacture everything on our own ground, is not necessarily very efficient. At the end of the day, what we have suffered from during that crisis, and I'm not blaming anybody for that, but it's more an issue of anticipation, logistics, rather than a, an issue of manufacturing on the French soil. What we should manufacture on the French soil are uh, high-value products that would attract research and development, that would generate uh, good jobs, good salaries. And it is our fate. It's an economic obligation. Since we have a high labor cost, uh, uh, we have the highest social charges in the world. So we are forced to manufacture um, uh, costly products. And those costly products are not necessarily uh, first necessity products. And 
Uh, 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 to continue along this line, and then we can uh, talk about positive points. But the idea of relocating Dolly Pran, which is something that I wouldn't have done, because Dolly Pran, I believe you can buy Dolly Pran very easily. And we have done it because, for political reasons, it's good to say, you know, you know, it's a painkiller if you have a headache. Uh, uh, Dolly Pran is manufactured by Sanofi, by the way. Uh, no, I'm not criticizing Sanofi. I am just uh, uh, saying that uh, it's a political uh, 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 critics. You know, Sanofi did benefit from the situation. But what is fascinating in the health industry and the fact that it should be industrialized and health sovereignty, how do we organize ourselves so we will make a great innovation in France to have a smooth access to markets, to have plants, to have the best researchers in the world? Que des emplois and this is going arrivée, to be done with, uh, you know, jobs Donc, and uh, logistics uh, uh, supply chains that need to be envisaged. We should look at innovation and we should look at the future and we should not get bogged down in this uh, idea of sovereignty. And I'd like to refer to Emmanuel Kong's work, who is one of the best experts uh, in France. The issue of economic sovereignty is very difficult to define. And when you start opening the door of uh, uh, that issue of sovereignty, you could find anything, and uh, uh, you will not uh, end up with a very rigorous economic uh, position. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry to, to say that right from the outset. Avec, avec plaisir. Je vais, je vais, je vais être dans peut-être dans yeah, d'autres termes, mais assez d'accord like avec, to, uh, avec say something. Well, uh, actually, I uh, quite agree with what you just said. My challenge with uh, uh, relocating is that it means that we are going to bring uh, something back, something that has left. And so we are going to bring back something that is old, and we're looking backward, uh, we're looking at something that has left. But sovereignty uh, is not a problem as such, providing that uh, we try to make it uh, uh, um, something uh, that uh, will translate into a multiple strategy, not self-sufficiency uh, and not the fact that we are going to close ourselves. We could have, we could anticipate our stock strategies a little bit more on essential products, and we could have multiple supply chains and also um, sources of uh, the supply, like the maritime uh, uh, um, routes and. Uh, um, and contrary to what we've been doing, we should continue to have uh, trade flows, commercial flows, and not to close borders, because if you have relocation, now, you are displacing the geographical risk, meaning that somebody is going to have a problem somewhere. So we have to create an interdependency, a positive power plays. You will produce what you are going to need tomorrow. So somebody somewhere will need what we are manufacturing. And in return, it will happen somewhere else. So we should create that positive power play. And it will happen if we invest in innovation in, on future needs rather than relocating uh, past needs. Thank you very much. I'm going to give the floor to Pierre Luzo. Can you hear us? Yes, very well. So we just had two negative opinions on the mere fact that it would be relevant to relocate part of the production of medicines. Could you please tell us what you're doing and give us your position? I'm not sure you uh, are of the same opinion. Well, I do have the same opinion on some of the points. Sequence is a global integrated group for pharmaceutical synthesis. We do manufacture the uh, uh, active ingredients and uh, we have 24 sites in the world and 14 of them in France. So I'm really interested in these uh, relocating uh, topics. We've been able to relocate 
had sequenced many uh, 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 long before the COVID hit. In 2003, we had three front sites, and we strongly invested on those on this territory. Coming back to what Nicolas Bouzou said about Asia and about what happened during the COVID. India didn't uh, hit the fact that uh, uh, the, the medical, uh, uh, what they call medical pharmacy, the fact that they would supply the rest of the world with medicines. And today, India is the first supplier of generic medicines in the world. The pharmaceutical industry in India is supplying about half of the global demand in vaccines, 40% of the American demand. And on March the 3rd, 2020, the Indian government forbade exports of about 10 active ingredients so the medicines would be uh, restricted to the Indian territory and export of the paracetamol was allowed only three months later on May the 28th, 2020. So there's a real issue of uh, medical uh, diplomacy from countries which do have that health weapon uh, at their disposal because they manufacture on their territory. And that's a real problem. And to be very honest with you, we need to define what needs to be relocated in order to treat people, and you need active ingredients to do so. And the crisis has demonstrated in a very strong manner that uh, we did lack about 10 essential molecules. And that a sequence, we've been able to uh, uh, know that there were two reasons for that, the strong increase of demand. Looking at uh, catamino propofol in uh, hospitals, but also the very sensitive drop of the supply because uh, uh, India stopped uh, uh, the uh, export. So we do have to protect ourselves from this. And I believe that the only long-lasting way of doing it is that, that we should reinforce the industrial fabric so on the long term we can uh, have a safe supply of those molecules. Thank you very much. Serge Bernasconi, I'm giving you the floor, and then we'll move on to the next uh, uh, topic, which is timing. I tend to agree with Nicolas and Olivier, but also with Pierre. Uh, in uh, the field of technical devices or technical technologies, uh, many of them are already produced in Europe. So it's not that we are 100% dependent on uh, industrial fabrics outside Europe, looking at ventilators. Some of them are produced in Germany, um, in Ireland. So we are already in Europe. Now, what are we talking about? We're using, you know, we big uh, 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 phrases saying we're going to reshore industry, but what about industry are we going to relocate? We cannot relocate the whole of industry. Now, what do we consider to be strategic products? And then we have to determine what we are going to do. In the field of uh, uh, medical uh, devices or tests, we tend to assemble element. So we're very dependent on a number of suppliers, varied suppliers. And it's not as simple. We, we cannot say we're going to relocate everything in Europe, because whether we want it or not, we are going to be dependent on a number of suppliers anyway. And they are located everywhere in the world. Now, where are there any solutions? I think we need to have that discussion. What happened during the crisis was very interesting. But as industries, we've been able to meet the demand. Of course, the, at one point, uh, uh, we, uh, have, we haven't done it uh, right away. But uh, we have to understand what did happen. It was not only in Europe. We've seen a problem inside Europe when you have countries closing their borders 
which I believe was incredible. And you depend on uh, parts coming from Italy to go to Ireland to uh, make ventilators. Well, there is a problem inside Europe. We need to open borders. I think everybody uh, was surprised by the crisis, even though we should have seen it coming. And it has generated some absurd situations. So, first of all, we need to make sure that in the future we will not find ourselves in that situation. Number two, we have to determine what we need and we have to be realistic. I fully agree with that. It is an illusion to believe that we are going to be able to make in Europe tomorrow. There are consequences. There is a time issue, a cost issue. Who is going to pay for it? Are we prepared to do it? And we need to have a discussion I think this crisis uh, has uh, generated an opportunity, which is that we should start having a discussion. There are solutions, but not repatriating everything in Europe. There are solutions at the European level that we have to look at. There are alternatives to just relocating everything to Europe, because that's an illusion. Thank you very much. We are going to move to the next topic, which is the issue of the timing of re partial relocation of uh, part of the production. We've asked the question to Paul Hudson, and uh, we'll uh, 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 listen to him. So the real challenge is how quickly can you do this? Now, again, for Sanofi, we manufacture medicines in Europe for Europe right now, but it's not the same for every single company. You know, we've set up an opportunity by spinning out some of our manufacturing to allow other companies to jump in and make essential medicines in our facilities. They do it to a certain extent now, but to do more of it. We think uh, that work is already happening, but for others to join, it'll be one, two, or maybe even three years, but it's still worth doing. You know, uh, there could be another pandemic or there could just be a general shortage of medicines that people really need, the chronically sick. So um, it started and it just simply must continue. Voilà, donc un, deux, trois ans pour donc one, two or three years in order to repatriate part of the production. Pierre Luzo, I think you wanted to say something else. When we talked to each other, you told me what you were doing and what were the consequences in terms of timing and cost. So I'm going to start with the timing. I might be a little bit less positive than Paul Hudson. I believe that to relocate molecules, chemical molecules, in a competitive and responsible way is going to take between three to five years. First of all, because uh, it takes a long time, the validation processes uh, are very long. We do have uh, uh, GMP standards that are very rigorous and they have to be controlled and uh, that's the way it should be done. It's something that in France and in Europe uh, uh, we cannot negotiate. I believe that in order to speed things up, there's something that is fairly simple to do. Since we're being asked to relocate, we should be using industrial sites that are available in Europe because that is going to be the quickest way and the most efficient way to do it. Competences on our activities are there. We do have the infrastructures, and so we have to avoid doing what was announced in the US by President Trump, i.e. to build new plants in order to manufacture the uh, medicines from yesterday and for uh, uh, tomorrow. We do have uh, some sites available. We need to invest in innovative technologies that could be competitive. But it's going to take a long time. And uh, I'd like to add one point. Obviously, we need to coordinate our European approach. France alone is not going to be able to do it. And we need to take a European approach for the whole added value chain in order to avoid creating chronic overcapacities that would destroy our industry. In any case, I agree with what was said by Serge Bernasconi. We cannot repatriate everything. It's an illusion 
the pharmaceutical industry is a global industry. There are many interdependencies and many global markets. We need to focus on the molecules uh, that uh, are out of stock, and the molecules which have uh, demonstrated that there was uh, shortages during the crisis, and we need to work on this. Three to five years, I believe, is the right timing. Thank you very much. Nicolas, do you want to say something? Yes, I fully agree. The fact that uh, to set up plants in France, it's very complicated. It takes a long time. It's about seven years. It takes seven years to, 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 to build an operational plant, yes, to get all the approvals. There is a big discussion today within the uh, uh, political majority because there is a law for administrative simplification, which is being uh, discussed at the National Assembly. Guillaume Garland, the re rapporteur, is trying to reduce the timing. And uh, there is the uh, environmentalist uh, in the majority with Barbara Pompili. She's in favor of strengthening uh, control checks and therefore uh, longer times. So there is a discussion within the um, parliamentary majority. But in any case, it's going to take a long time to set up plans in France or to repatriate, which is the same thing. So how do we make our industrial tool bigger and more adapted or more scalable? Because that's uh, what is fascinating, intellectually speaking. How can we manage to have an industrial tool that could uh, manufacture different types of uh, products? Let's let me use an example very briefly. At the beginning of the crisis, we said we need mask plants in France, but the answer is no. We were talking about overproduction. Here we face with a respiratory virus. Next time it might be a digestive virus, and we might need something else. So the question is not to have face plants, uh, 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 mask plants, but a, a plant that can produce other things. It worked very well with the hydroalcoholic gel. He, last week somebody came to see me and gave me a big bottle of gel, and I said, but of sanitizer. And and I said, but what are you doing? And he said, I make a barbecue sauce. So, you know, we need to take policies that will favor investments. That's the right angle. We need to push investments forward in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm opening uh, an open door here, but in industry as general, we need to uh, push investments forward in the digital. We don't have many robots in France, additive manufacturing, 3D printing. We don't have any uh, uh, enough 3D printing in France. And we need to increase our industrial capacity and make it more flexible. I'm not going to make any comments on timing, but just to add two points. In fact, the production chain is quite complex. So what are we talking about? We're talking about manufacturing, packaging, finishing, raw materials. It takes time, and like Nicolas was saying, on top of the technological and technical time, it takes administrative time. In France, we have very strict uh, environmental and social standards, and so uh, it, it, there is a, 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 a timing that uh, cannot be reduced. I'd like to give you a personal example. We are talking about producing a future medicines, and we are going to move from a chemical medicine, dry uh, form medicine, to a more biological medicine, and bioproduction in France is quite late. We have 32 sites of bioproduction, and amongst those sites, what is lacking is the ability to produce commercial packs, to be in a situation to manufacture and to supply. And I had a personal experience because we are involved uh, in uh, looking for a vaccine in the partnership with the Oxford University. When we tried to create our supply chain in France with partners, we couldn't find in France the right partner that would be able to modify 
his chains quickly to include our living viral um, vector. Nobody, I haven't found anybody in front. There is no partner available, and it's not possible because of the timing and because of the production capacity. So these are challenges, real challenges that we have. And we need to uh, find a way to be able to respond very quickly, to shift very quickly from one chain that was dedicated to something to something else, or a car manufacturer making ventilators, LVMH uh, making sanitizer. Um, so we, we can shift a chain or reinvent uh, uh, production. So these are interesting challenges. And, uh, this would overcome the difficulty of uh, starting uh, building a plant from scratch. Now, medical devices have been involved in this ability to uh, make production more flexible. So I will uh, let you answer, Pierre Luzo. Now, the question about timing, I don't know if I can answer that. Some products could be manufactured quicker. For others, it would take longer. We're talking about health products. We're not uh, 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 making candies. We're making health products. There are strong and demanding uh, regulations, which is very good because this is uh, 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 reassuring patients. I think there are parameters. We need to think at the European level. We cannot think at the country level. And also, one of the problems is uh, how much we, how much are we talking about? We talk, it's, which volume are we talking about? Which type of demand? One of the big problems that we had during the first phase of the crisis was that nobody knew what we were talking about. Were we talking about 10,000, 100,000, 1 million? Industries have tried to respond as fast as possible, but I think we do have many ventilators today on uh, car parks waiting uh, to be um, rented. I think that uh, we need to discuss this with authorities, and not only national authorities. It would be necessary for national authorities to agree at the European level, and we could already have uh, a, a vision. We don't know where we're going to. We understand the principle, which is fully acceptable, but we don't know uh, what the quantity is. If we don't uh, 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 do that work, if tomorrow we have to be faced with a second wave, we won't have time to change production size. We'll have to do with uh, what we had. I, I believe, I hope that uh, uh, it will be easier than uh, for the first time. But then we have to talk about what we want, uh, how, and um, for how long. The time, you know, it cannot be a short time. I know that, unfortunately, sometimes there is a political pressure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The next pandemic, if we don't have any face masks, um, that won't do it. Yeah, industries are faced with that political pressure, and we uh, need to find a way, you know, because we are being told, okay, tomorrow you need to have a production site in France for all products. And you know what? We love you, but we won't be able to do it. The other topic is collaboration between industries. Um, we know that uh, many industries have started to collaborate, uh, that you have uh, collaborated with uh, some universities. Do you think there would be more collaboration? So, uh, within the framework of this uh, vaccine development, we have uh, been working with universities and uh, we launched a partnership with uh, what we call the CDMO, those manufacturing, so bottling, for instance, and uh, so that's extremely interesting uh, for you with a type, type of uh, partnership. Uh, so it's production, but not necessarily kind of internal production to diversity 
is that these partnerships are really important. And if we talk about vaccine for a few moments, we have partnerships with MSD, Cancerology, DASI, DASI, thank you, in Cancerology, because we can do R&D as well as uh, commercialization together. So we can pool resources, mutual resources, and uh, leverage each other's expertise. So for ADC, antibodies, uh, which are highly innovative, and we have this capacity and experience in oncology. And uh, that is, is there and uh, slightly ahead in, uh, them in this field. So it's something that, when it comes to go to market, it's uh, something that can uh, allow us to move faster. Uh, to meet uh, patients' needs faster. So PPP, uh, looking at other partnerships uh, uh, for goods and markets, and uh, so now is the time to open up. So Sanofi has a partnership with GSK on vaccine as well. We asked a question to Paul Hudson. Let's uh, listen to Paul Hudson now. To satisfy all of the needs of all of the essential medicines, you need a high degree of collaboration, you need to share facilities, which is why we're creating this standalone uh, facility uh, or six facilities across Europe that could respond to that demand. But it also needs uh, some serious collaboration from governments across Europe. You have to understand why we're in this situation to begin with. As pressure came on prices for genericized medicines or essential medicines in Europe, uh, inevitably uh, they moved to areas with lower labor costs, perhaps not quite as strict quality controls like India and China which meant prices just kept falling, so we couldn't afford to do it. Now, to have the right labor laws, to have the right quality standards here in Europe means that governments will have to step in and say, we will buy a percentage or all of the essential medicines uh, from a trusted manufacturing base here in Europe for Europe. So that may have a premium to it, but it's really just to reflect the cost of making medicines in Europe. And uh, that means we will guarantee supply and that collaboration is going to be essential. It's good because he's, he's embarked on three different topics and set of questions, the state and the cost of production. So let's uh, look at the uh, collaborations. That's the good side of the crisis. For the first uh, time in the history of mankind, all the countries around the world have a common enemy uh, to address. It's a virus. Namely, it's not in war where there's oppositions within mankind, and uh, here it's not the case. This is a global crisis, and at the end of the day, it's in, uh, an extremely important opportunity to collaborate uh, globally. And uh, so we have been, you know, some of the economies have been shattered by what has been going on. Look at what's happening in the governments uh, these days. Uh, irrespective of what they're doing, this is not good. And uh, they do this, they do that, and it doesn't address the issues. So, but uh, the brighter side of things is that it uh, compels us to change our habits in industrial fields. Uh, it compels us to move towards collaborations that will put together people who are, uh, in some other respects, uh, competitors. Now, in terms of the strategy of the business and management, I think uh, the uh, many companies will get out of this uh, period stronger. And um, this is such, it has been such a shock and changes uh, have been so significant that uh, and, uh, go back, not at all. And if uh, after the crisis we go back to the habits of before the crisis, that means that uh, the crisis will have, would only have n had negative effects. So collaborations between between public, private sectors, uh, between private uh, stakeholders in terms of what we're learning in terms of uh, regulatory uh, stumbling blocks, uh, obstacles. And we need to take away you know, those, those lessons. And uh, after this very, very serious crisis, there's a, a rebirth and crisis we're going to be experiencing in France over the next weeks and months. 
It's going to be disastrous, yes. It's going to be very complicated. But I'm very optimistic, you know, uh, comes, you know, five years, ten years down the road. Uh, I think the, the big winners of the uh, crisis will be the, you know, uh, beyond the uh, those in their 50s will be the younger generation. So there's lots of takeaways there. And uh, the positive effect of the crisis will be over the long, will be felt in the long run. How about you? What is your take on this? Well, as, a, as I stated at the start, uh, we are a very technology-intensive uh, business. We used to working with uh, many different uh, suppliers uh, in the phases of the COVID. Some of the experiences have been successful. Others have led to failures. And uh, war has been a source of concern here is to uh, manage to produce the quality, to deliver quality products. And in the phase of crisis, everything opens up. We can do everything because at the core, you know, lies the patient. So patient is key. And from an industrial standpoint, we did not manage to meet the level of requirements that we must uh, uh, comply with that we must deliver in the field of medical uh, industry. Now, yes, we can do, but there has to be a demand for quality. In, uh, we should not be in a form of reactivity, but in form of proactivity. What can what else can can be done? Uh, corporations, opportunities there. Uh, yeah. That's interesting, uh, but uh, careful now. You have masks, okay? But I'd be concerned, very concerned, to see what can be done, what has been done in terms of masks. But I'm not convinced that all masks uh, meet quality standards and quality requirements from a regulatory standpoint, from a medical standpoint. Everybody can uh, manufacture a mask. But if you wear masks that don't protect you, that are not efficient, then as an issue there. And uh, so we are in a regulated uh, sector, requirements in terms of quality, efficiency. We can't question that. I'll be a bit more optimistic than Nicola in terms of the five to ten year period. I think within the next three years, you know, three years down the road. And at AstraZeneca, we uh, drove these with France Tech, France Digitech and MedTech in France. Uh, what we call the uh, collaboration for innovation and health, for so uh, bringing together our synergies uh, within a matter of 48 hours, 400 startups uh, um, um, approached us so patients can stay at home as opposed to going to hospitals so, so to prevent any bottleneck in the hospitals and, uh, and collaborations between cities and hospitals. Uh, and uh, not all of this was successful, but over 20 laboratories uh, partnered uh, with us. We had the LAM in support of these, Uvalto Santé, APHP, the Paris Greater uh, Paris Hospital Authority, and 2.5 million for 20 projects. I have been shortlisted over the out of the uh, 400 at the start. So that's really these cooperations is key for uh, to address uh, in an innovative way impact uh, and um, on healthcare delivery. As a response to the crisis, uh, uh, you know, the patients is at the center of this. Uh, we've seen extremely interesting partnerships in the digital field. Uh, so we spent years to say whether we would make progress or not. But within a matter of weeks, as opposed to years, we addressed all these issues. And uh, we did a tremendous step forward. And I agree, we should not go back to what things were like because of the pre-crisis. Because in some of the countries, people feel this will to say, oh, hold on, hold on a second, that was crisis mode. But that uh, bears a significant extra additional cost, maybe we might not. We might not take care or reimburse this a lot. But we want to, we've demonstrated that this uh, provides what we what was done for uh, offer solutions for the patients and it would be a uh, real shame real pity to say well that it was only during the crisis now it's over it's back to how things were. Yeah, so 
Thanks to COVID crisis, may we, we've um, made this tremendous leap forward and to demonstrate that there was, there was solutions indeed. And, and please, 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 let us not get back. Uh, so the role of states, uh, so uh, Paulson said, well, uh, state, the states must commit so when it comes to sovereignty, European uh, sovereignty, so um, the states have played passive roles in crisis. And, uh, so what will be the role of the states uh, to encourage and to spur on industrial players? We can be very critical towards one country and government, uh, but it uh, state has done tremendous things to support its economy. This has been the French state, namely, and uh, consisting in saying that the strategy of the, I attended some of those meetings and I said, people said, well, we're going to do our utmost to protect businesses and what was done was done. And it was unprecedented, it's no, it's unparalleled. And uh, we also need for businesses to understand that the state in France uh, is on the side of its businesses and uh, has put up uh, massive resources and this will come to an end because the recovery plan is a historical recovery plan. And uh, it's unprecedented. There will never be one like that uh, in the future. So, and it's very much linked to what we said. Temptation in France, is, as can be seen in now, uh, uh, promote medical services. Uh, said, well, doing crisis, okay, you know, it is more hard in the field of uh, hospital organizations. So we address lots of uh, obstacles during the crisis, and uh, we're going to be putting these uh, constraints back. Uh, so, um, on, um, and this is up to us to do, uh, you know, when it comes to telemedicine, when it comes to um, organizations, and uh, what we did during the crisis uh, is a source of extremely concrete outcome and source of inspiration. So we need to push the states. Uh, so let us take a look at the next video of uh, poets and what would he require from the states. Uh, yeah, I, I do have some advice, which is to stand back and understand what we're trying to do here. Uh, on one hand, ministers of health from across the countries in Europe, major countries, call me to say, we can't get this drug or we can't get that drug, can you help? And they disconnect it from the fact that prices were driven so low that they ended up in China and India. You can't really disconnect those conversations. But we're also realistic so that we know that um, as uh, supply comes back on, they will inevitably move to the lower cost countries again because economies will be under pressure, clearly, after COVID-19. What we need is states stepping forward and saying, you know, we understand that it's important to have a uh, continuity of supply, so a percentage of our purchasing will come from medicines made in Europe. Maybe not all, but we need to make sure that the patients do not go without. That's got to be the absolute number one priority. And the cost difference we're talking is small and only reflects the cost of having high quality workers in Europe. So, you know, we ask, I ask people to step back and say, understand the big picture, because a, a, a cent saved here can mean somebody goes without a medicine and that just isn't acceptable. All of us are in healthcare for the right reasons and we have to find a way to bridge that gap. I think it can be done. Alors Pierre Luzo, on est dans, en plein dans le, le, la question justement. So really full on in terms of the, the matter pertaining to the additional cost of producing in Europe. And this is your job. So give us orders of magnitude what that entails and to take concrete examples and say what this would involve. My uh, introductions was to take place in Europe. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I fully agree with what uh, Paul Hudson said. So uh, limiting us, um, stop uh, disruptions or shortages. Let us work and continue to work on innovations, looking at our quality process and uh, respectful of the environment and obviously efficient. When we work on this competitive process, I'm talking about technologies we're going to be using. We show many, many um, drugs that uh, sequence so uh, continues 
uh, chemistry. Uh, more competitive, making it more competitive than our Asian uh, competitors. The consumption of energy of a few tenths of percentage, the uh, packaging production units uh, by factor 10 or 100, making them more efficient and allowing to have a number of sequencing and uh, chemical reactions we more limited. In other words, to sum up, we come to equivalent costs that of Asian manufacturers or lower costs. So in specific cases at a paracetamol in which we work, we're working very actively. So. If we take the cost of paracetamol in terms of its active principle, that accounts under 5% for the consumer. And if we take the, into account the uh, potential over cost uh, to manufacture this in Europe to uh, reshore it, we're talking, you know, 1%, uh, 1% uh, out of the price of uh, price tag of one box of paracetamol. And this is a if that's the cost of reshoring, well, as Paul Hudson said, let's not, uh, you know, let's be straight about this and uh, let's not, uh, you know, let's be clear about what's at stake and what's, uh, uh, and then uh, what lies at the core of this debate. It means that that's people want, clearly, because a box of paracetamol, that's uh, two euros, it's from two euros to two euros and five uh, cents. Is that a, a problem? Uh, well, it's not a problem, but uh, they are, you know, these reshoring operations uh, allowed and made possible by, uh, thanks to technologies uh, 20 years ago when these uh, relocations were, they were justified at the time by the cost of the uh, labor. And um, now this equation, this economic uh, equation is outdated because industry can deliver uh, improvements in uh, efficiencies uh, made possible by digital artificial intelligence, what we call the uh, manufacturing capability 4.0. So we've uh, kind of uh, stayed, I might say, on an old industrial model. So we can and uh, we need to ramp up very quickly the machines uh, if we want to reassure. It means that what uh, uh, was key in the restart plan was that, okay, at the end of the day, the best we can do for uh, re, uh, reshoring is to find investment is to be put in place. Uh, uh, economic policies, measures to encourage uh, um, industrial players to reindustrialize and renew capital investments. Once we've said that, uh, for reshoring for sovereignty issues, if the cost is at a limited cost, we must do it. And uh, but let's know. Let's us be clear when it comes to reshoring, in terms of jobs. We're talking between 10 and 20 percent of uh, um, you know, decisions are led to uh, relate to uh, uh, labor costs. So, and if we were to be sure, we would uh, gain an additional five to ten percent. Uh, we won't relocate uh, or reshore everything. And uh, because the share of uh, labor cost in the uh, analytic accounting of uh, manufacturing plants is, you know, almost uh, involved reshoring with very few jobs. So some say in the public debate, we need to reshore, we need to bring back our jobs. That's not going to work that way. But if for reasons related to uh, independence uh, with all reservations, we can reshore with an increasing cost that's m limited, that's an open door. That's uh, obviously, that's stating the obvious here. And in economic policy, these orders of magnitude, um, we, know, we need to know what we're talking about here. Yeah. Very difficult because yet again, if I'm talking about masks, that's one thing. If I talk about ventilators, that's really, really, you know, we're talking 15, 20,000 euros per unit and a few cents for masks. It's very difficult to uh, answer that question. But what I can say is um, authorities uh, have made tremendous efforts to restart 
the economy. I think it's absolutely incredible, and I wish uh, to, uh, there's been criticism and really not positive criticisms on these respects. Uh, I think indeed we, it took us some time to to take uh, to to react and to take measure to take measures. Uh, uh, to address the crisis, but uh, I think, uh, to be quite honest, it's extremely complex to understand how we can what can be done, and, uh, how we need to explain how we can you know, move forward in European level and French in, in France here. So it's interesting to see how people react and from two euros to two uh, point uh, ten euros for a box of uh, you know, uh, medicine. Well, it's, uh, people uh, that prices has gone up even for ten cents. People react in extremely you know and and and. Uh, founded manner, uh, so we need to be, uh, I mean, the price is extremely sensitive even for drugs uh, to, to treat your health. It's not going to be, it's not going to change, you know, 10% is it's nothing. No, we're talking 1% or 2% price hike. And secondly, we're talking about investments to, to reach, involved in reshoring. Uh, issue is not about short term. My uh, thinking is that long uh, term based. Okay, you might manufacture back in Europe, you might be so, so competitive in terms of the productions that might come from uh, China or Malaysia or others. We're going to be accepting this for some time. We're going to be doing that for some time uh, because we want to be sovereign in production. What's going to be happening in three years, five years, ten years down the line? And you know what? I can find cheaper in Asia. And then uh, all of a sudden, um, uh, might go back to the uh, old model. So. Oh, we might create uh, protection measures to protect what's manufactured here in Europe. And now we come to additional difficulties related to international markets, international corporations, because as you know, if we start subsidizing too much some of our industries, we might end up with um, problems on our hands. Uh, the issue really is not about short term, it's on the medium to long term. Is this system sustainable? And if it is sustainable, are we uh, accepting its cost? And if so, yes, why not? Not necessarily very confident saying I'm going to be ready five years, 10. Uh, you're uh, 10 years down the line, it might cost 10 to 20 percent more. Uh, so indeed, I agree in terms of creating a sustainable system to guarantee the right care, protection of risks, and uh, so the key ambitions might be a pitfall yeah, to move away from or stay away from. Shouldn't be a discussion on for or against uh, reshoring. Public debate is now stigmatizing all this. And um, the challenge is you really look at reshoring is a solution for some of the products under some circumstances. That's not something we see in the political debate. Sometimes we, people focus on one word that's ill used and becomes a for or against. That's not the case. That's not the point. And you now this is against uh, reshore. Shoring at all costs, but uh, uh, but not really reshoring is not the only way forward. Uh, so we need to step out of this uh, uh, opposition, and uh, so that's the final question precisely. Uh, we wanted to address here. Uh, so was it a top priority question or were there other questions to ask ourselves for Europe to address possible health challenges because there might be others. Uh, there's been four pandemics in the uh, 20th century. So let's take a look at uh, what Paul Hudson has to say on that. And then it will be over to you. So it's an excellent question about R&D manufacturing innovation. You know, there's a much broader question. How does Europe compete with the US and China? The Chinese R&D uh, used to be really about manufacturing. Then it became about drug development. Now it's about basic science. The investment and the opportunity in China is so great that China will be a force in innovation. We know, of course, the US is already a force with more than 90% of venture capital 
and investments and new opportunities coming in the US on the east or the west coast. It's time for Europe to step forward a little bit more. The number of Nobel Prizes for medicine is significant in Europe, but the translational medicine link between academia and starting a company to make sure a medicine can be pushed through a 10-year development cycle and come out the other side to change a patient's life is a long-term commitment. You have to make sure that in Europe there is a real opportunity to maintain that commitment. To do that, it has to be attractive as a union. To do that, you need to make sure that innovation that already exists is rewarded. So when prices on innovation or uh, prescriptions for innovation are constricted, it means Europe becomes less attractive. So there has to be a sort of overall understanding of the long-term innovation cycle, what that means for individual member states and how they're committed to building a, a productive ecosystem and not rationing innovation now. You know, in the end, pharmaceuticals are normally 9, 10% of the total healthcare bill. It's a lot, I understand. But the, where we need to move to is a world where the value is properly understood and not just the price the value for the patient and for the health system. And we see that every day. That has to change that dynamic. Europe has to be a uh, health sovereign and it needs to have a vibrant innovation base. Voilà, donc il, il dit trois choses. Hein. Il dit euh, la Chine, c'est so telling three things. Uh, so uh, uh, China has uh, evolved and moved towards innovation. So uh, the US is more is, and Europe must commit to it. R and D to innovate, and then he's telling us then this will come at a price. Uh, uh, the reshoring is a. Uh, uh, a legitimate uh, topic, but in the health context, in the environmental and current economic context, how do we go about having a health industry that develops a lot in the coming years? Was that the case uh, over the um, first few years? Well, I looked at uh, medical uh, devices with our friends from Medtech in France uh, and blockages, existing blockages here. You can see that the entrepreneurial uh, fabric is extremely dense in France with less challenges here and there in terms of contracting with the public, not enough capital access. And even if, uh, honestly, we are doing the job, right, not uh, the, on, the, on the part with the, uh, the Americans yet, but with tremendous issues in terms of um, obtaining uh, um, certifications, um, approvals, and uh, some in industrial players um, tell us it's easier to sell uh, medical devices in China or in the US than in Germany. So need to, to take to draw the lessons, really to, to, to draw the, the conclusions there. And so the very, very good news is that with this crisis, Europe has made giant leaps forward. And uh, as in all crises, Europe uh, starts the late and then does the job uh, when it gets into gear. And uh, what I can say is that this is a change in the mindset. Uh, we've unlocked this mental blockage with we in Europe where there's a kind of free market for the consumer. And now we are in the mind of uh, European elites. Uh, we're moving towards towards Europe with a will, technological will uh, power from a technical, technological and uh, economic um, standpoint. So Europe uh, means a peacekeeper in economic terms, so it is lagging behind, not synced with the reality of the world as uh, uh, the world of business is um, from a Chinese and American standpoint. So us and you, but especially you, you help Europe Could you say, well, where are these blocking points um, what well, can be addressed? Because here, there's a window of opportunity that's just opened up. 
Is that your standpoint? Yes, earlier we talked about the rule of the state. And what the state does well is it expresses a real voluntary approach and real openness in terms of uh, dialogue. And uh, the issue is that when there, when there's a will to go in a direction with the public service and then we one step forward, one step back. And price, we've seen that with the price of uh, the uh, medicine, and uh, but we talk about uh, the overall price of uh, medicine is you know, up 0% over the last 10 years. So, But stating that uh, to 10% involves about 15%, 14-15%. So innovation is uh, welcome, and we turn cancer in, into a chronic uh, disease that's been the case for five, 10 years now at a constant price, at constant budget. And so there's no sector that's uh, just as limited as no, none of that, yeah. And uh, you know, uh, say it being 100%. So we have two minutes to go. Uh, so this uh, COVID-19 situation and crisis uh, is a fantastic opportunity to really review the entire system. And this is the world we must exemplify in Europe and that uh, the countries. Uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately, Europe remains a complicated market, especially in the field of health, as a debate there. But how are we going to address health in Europe? Who does what? Who decides what? Because uh, the manifest phase of what happened between the state, regions, Europe, who did what? Who could decide? Want. So here we have the opportunity to look at the system to make a decision at some point. Uh, should we give more power to Europe or should we not? Uh, and what's the uh, what are the implications? So a lot of work has been done. Uh, and um, you can see with Thierry Breton has been really instrumental trying to, to change this mindset and approach. Um, so fingers crossed, I think what's going to be important is to to keep the dialogue open. Let us not be let's not be fearful of moving forward. And maybe we might accept to have more, uh, less control, fewer controls for more efficiency. We need to make a decision because we can't go on like that. That's Europe, that's not Europe, that's um, my prerogatives, we, we don't. So this is back in February up until now. This is not sustainable because uh, efficiency is impacted. And, but in Europe, we're very proactive. We do have ideas. And um, the medical field, uh, Europe is a phenomenal source of innovation. I think we have funds in Europe. What's lacking is a certain vision, a certain serenity and, uh, into the next 10 years. Uh, we are in this phase of innovation. We need to get things organized and we need to recover what we had. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Per Luzo, for being with us uh, for this video link. And we'll start again at 10.30 on the role of insurers in tomorrow's help. Thank you very much. 